Salaam, peace. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and Muslim Network TV. Pretty soon we'll be on Apple TV as well. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a strange world at this moment. There are a whole lot of people looking for food. Actually, before pandemic, 100 days ago, there were still 35 million Americans who were did not have food security, which means they are unable to find enough food for themselves and their families. And now that 45.5 million people have become jobless, that's huge. In Mississippi, they were saying 25% of the people do not have food. Now they are saying the same thing about New York City. New York City actually says that one in four New Yorkers need food. While all of this is going on, somebody is making money. And these are billionaires. Are they working hard to make this money? How they have positioned themselves? Are there good billionaires and bad billionaires? What is going on in our country? Well, poor, we were told, are becoming poorer and poorer, and now they're looking more for food, while billionaires are becoming billionaires. Well, they were already billionaires, but they are increasing their wealth. Um, they have increased since in last three months by 20%. That how much it is? It's half a trillion dollar. So while the world is suffering, economy is going down, people are looking for food, how come billionaires have just made half a trillion dollars? Well, somebody knows that. And that is Omar Ocampo. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Um, thank you for having me, Imam uh, Malik. It's a pleasure to be here. Omar Campo has co-authored a report with Chuck Collins and Sofia Peslaski about Billionaire Bonanza 2020, wealth windfalls, tumbling taxes, and pandemic profiteers. Wow, you not only know how to research, but come up with the name which attracts <laughs> people, huh? Billionaire's Bonanza. Yeah. What about, the... making, what about making a... Uh, making a, um, a a television series on that billionaire bonanza. <laughs> you know, you know, it's interesting because back in the day they used to have like lifestyles of the rich and famous. So, like, uh, you know, might as well bring that back. Yeah, especially, especially in our current context, and you know, um, you know, we see how you know uh, wealth is uh, you know starting to uh, distribute itself to the top. Yeah, mm -hmm. Omar Acampo is a researcher for the program on inequality and the common good at the Institute for Policy Studies. He graduated, from, he, he graduated from the University of Massachusetts, Boston with a BA in political science and holds a master's in international relations from the American University in Cairo. Umar is also a part of Latin-based grassroots organization called uh, Miente, did I pronounce correctly? Yeah, Miente, that's correct. Miente, Miente. Okay, all right. So, yeah. to, to, so tell me, what are these secrets have you discovered? I like you and me to become billionaires also at this time. Well, I think the the secret is to be owners um, and to have uh, you know uh, some leverage um, in the political system because uh, it is of my opinion that. Um, and the research shows is that when there's a, a unequal distribution of material resources and wealth, there's also an unequal distribution in um, how uh, people can influence the political process and their and their politicians. So if we want something, you know, uh, you know, to democratize our society, I think we we need to democratize the wealth as well. So uh, you know, like we can just take someone easy like Jeff Bezos. Uh, he um, he's seen the, the the greatest amount of increase in wealth uh, during the pandemic. He's uh, he started off the year worth 115 uh, billion, and uh, as of like yesterday, he was uh, worth 160 billion. 
So that's like a $45 billion increase that's greater than the GDP of Iceland. Um, so I think the, you know he's done a lot of things to make sure that uh, that he's, he was put in a, uh, in a position where he can uh, reap the benefits of what's happening in the pandemic. And that's you know getting tax breaks, uh, uh, exploiting every single tax loophole so he didn't have to pay taxes. That's something that his competition uh, can't do. Uh, sometimes he also lobbies uh, local and state governments for subsidies so they can open up warehouses. That's something his competition can't do. So um, so some people might say like, oh, he had like a great business model, but there's also some competitive advantage um, that he got because he was able to 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 um, get some influence from the state. So he got a great business model and he got a great tax saving model. And yeah. <laughs> so really that he doesn't pay any taxes on Amazon? Yeah, you know, and I think this is this is not just a, a an issue with uh, Mr. Bezos. It's I think it's an issue for um, all the highest income uh, earners in the country because one thing that the you know top one percent they always do is that they revolt against the tax system. So um, so even if we are able to pass some type of uh, legislation um, where there's an increase in taxes. Um, down the line, they're going to try to like be able to repeal it. And that's something they've been successful at doing since the 1970s. Um, so uh, our report also showed that, you know, the in, in relation to their wealth, the, the wealth, uh, the tax, ta the taxation of the billionaire class has gone down 79%. So that's uh, drastic. And then, you know, we asked ourselves, what do, you know, um, people do uh, with all this extra income? Um, from, you know, having less taxes, they don't normally invest it in productive activity and job growth, which is something that, you know, we're told happens, like they'll invest in the economy, things will get better, you know, society as a whole benefits. Um, but in our researchers, our research shows that they invested in, uh, you know, uh, just, in, you know, uh, speculative behavior and financial instruments, or sometimes they even lend the money uh, to the government by purchasing bonds, so they're so the government is actually borrowing from the people they're supposed to be taxing. So, <laughs> yeah, and giving them some money back. Exactly, and that money comes back comes from you know the the middle and working classes. You know, the so therefore it's a literal wealth transfer to the top. Hmm. What is the current uh, state of joblessness in our country? I mean, of course, you know, billionaires are making uh, uh, half a trillion dollar. Wow. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, so. So, what is the state of joblessness at this moment? At the same time, when these people are making tons of money, yeah, this is the I think the most disheartening part because um, I think there's over 45 million people who have filed for unemployment, and not only that, but household wealth in general has. Um, I think the Fed recently put out a, a report saying that $6.5 trillion of household wealth has vanished. Um, and that is a staggering that, number. That is in the last, uh, last three months? Yeah, since um, in the first quarter of 2020. Um, wow. And Six yeah. point, How much do you say? $6.5 trillion? $6.5 trillion in household wealth. Wow. Um, and to me, uh, it just shows that it's really a tale of two pandemics. So um, it highlights the fact that the stock market is not necessarily a reflection of the regular economy. Um, and it also highlights the fact that, you know, what is good for the rich is not necessarily good for the working and middle classes. And the, and the, and the way this is, I think that statistic is, is reflective of all that. You know, there's a $6.5 trillion wealth mm -hmm. vanished. Meanwhile, billionaires are gaining half a trillion dollars uh, during this time. So there's a huge uh, contrast and disparity. Wow, $6.5 trillion of household wealth, which is mm -hmm. lost. Mm -hmm. That's substantial, substantial amount. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to uh, take to recover, but that was built on already existing poverty on unemployment in this country, right? Exactly. So what was before, which was at the top of which people lost this much? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. How much was the, you know, poverty in existence oh. uh, before the pandemic? All right. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, this is this is actually a really interesting question because um, I don't think the U.S. actually measures poverty that well. So um, I think the statistic is that there's like 35 million people who are um, aren't, aren't aren't able to who would be considered uh, below the poverty line, um, and that's a that's a huge uh, amount of people. But then it also like I think poverty is relative depending on where you live because you know if you have you know twenty thousand dollars and you know uh, you know somewhere in the I don't know, like New York compared to somewhere like Montana, I think, uh, you know, for the person in Montana is better off than the person in New York because the cost of living in New York is so, is so much greater. So I think that the way we measure poverty is inadequate and I think it should be done on a state by state basis. And then we can have a real accurate picture. Uh, in my opinion, I think, um, you know, the, the bottom, you know, uh, 50% of the country, um, they have very little wealth. Um, so they're living more along the lines of like check by check, uh, you know, one emergency can throw them into, uh, you know, basically financial ruin. And that could be a car accident or something that, um, you know, we said in our report that um, most people are not able to, a good, a large portion, a lot of, a lot of people are not able to have a $400 emergency expense. You know, and this is in the you know the richest country in the world. So um, yeah, so poverty in itself um, uh, it was pretty bad before the pandemic, and I think is just exasperating it. And I think it's also revealing a lot because I think people are starting to like open their eyes at the at the at the huge disparities that that are occurring. So the people. I mean, who's taking care of all these people? I mean, there were 35 percent before, and now uh, you know a huge number of people who have become unemployed. Yes, there are some checks here uh, coming here and there, which are going to go away within a month or so. Who? What is our infrastructure uh, of taking care of poor people who are in need of food, who are struggling? who have lost, uh, you know, uh, huge amount, trillions of wealth. So where these people are, are the institutions and the mosque and the churches and people who are taking care of them are well financed to continue to handle that? What is the state of our uh, infrastructure to take care of poor people? I think uh, our infrastructure is actually not that good. So, like we, out of all the advanced economies um, in in the West, the United States has the worst uh, uh, safety net and also has the worst uh, record on uh, workers' rights um, and worker protections. So, um, I think the, you know, the the response to the pandemic was like you said, it was, we they gave people a twelve hundred dollar check. That's probably like two weeks of wages for your average worker. That's gone in a minute. Meanwhile, no, no, they did not give President Trump personally give them with his nature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, speaking of Trump, I mean, there's he did a tax cut in twenty in twenty seventeen. Um, it was estimated it'll cost a tr like a trillion dollars over the next ten years. And this just gives the, the government less resources to fight the health and economic crisis. And, you know, uh, and during the, the, the legislative process, uh, you know, for the, for the Corona relief, there was tax breaks uh, also given in there too. So like they're spending billions of dollars in bailouts. Um, they're printing trillions of dollars of money. Uh, they're buying corporate debt. Uh, so they're doing everything to uh, ensure that people who had wealth to begin with um, either are able to maintain their wealth. And I think their logic is that they think that if we just put hand, money in their hands, that it will somehow trickle down. Um, and I don't think uh, that is I don't think there's proof of that, especially since, you know, people are still being furloughed and laid off. So um, I think. Uh, I mean, our research, one of our recommendations is to put cash in the hands of consumers directly. Okay. So, so talking about the infrastructure to take care of the poor people, uh, one is the government aspect. Yes. And our private sector or individuals and, and uh, well-meaning people, uh, 
uh, I mean, when Katrina happened in New Orleans, I mean, Uncle Sam was nowhere to be found. <laughs> These were the people of the community and churches and mosques and their take. I mean, I remember raising money in Chicago and sending to the mosque there because they were feeding uh, tens of thousands of people. So, so are, are, how is their capacity increasing or decreasing to help people who are in need, who are, you know, in, in a way, first responders, they know the neighbor who need uh, funding. And uh, in, in the current crisis, while their income probably has also gone down, is there any study of that, uh, you know, a, 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 a private a religious or non-religious system of helping the people? Um, at the moment, I don't, I'm not sure if there has been uh, any uh, study of this, but um, there has been a lot of charity happening in the in the private sector, both religious and non-religious. So if I can give like a personal anecdote, the, there's a gym that I go to, it's called the YMCA. Um, I did not uh, suspend my membership because I knew that they were using the money from, you know, the, from members in order to feed and distribute food. Um, and in the area where I live. And I think, you know, that's that's phenomenal. Um, and I also think that, you know, um, my aunt, uh, her church, they do a lot of, uh, they, do, they do a lot of work, um, you know, with people who are having some type of necessity at the moment. And I think, uh, you know, this is crucial. And the, actually, you know, philanthropy and charitable giving has increased during this time. Um, but, if I can give like a, a critique of that is that it just doesn't scale on a national level, mm -hmm. you know, which I, which is why, you know, we advocate for some type of uh, governmental uh, social safety net um, to ensure that there's affordable housing um, and uh, you know, you know, and maybe even a guaranteed income. So the, but I'm definitely encouraged by the amount of, uh, charity that is that is being done, but it is nowhere the what is needed in a, such a major catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, uh, this is Malik Mujahid uh, on Muslim Network uh, TV, and I'm talking with Umar Ocampo, uh, who is from the Institute for uh, Policy Studies about poverty and billionaires. We'll be right back after these messages. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Omar Ocampo, who is with the Institute for Policy Studies. And we are talking about billionaires making half a trillion dollars in three months, while in the first quarter of this, uh, this year, uh, general wealth of the population has gone down by more than $5 trillion. How is it possible? What techniques billionaires are using and what people can do about that? And you're watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19, uh, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Raku, and of course, on our own website, muslimnetwork.tv. Uh, Umar, tell me this thing that... Uh, the systemic changes uh, uh, which you are recommending are tremendous, uh, but uh, are people listening? Do you have any evidence that uh, uh, that your uh, IPS Institute for Policy Studies is having some impact uh, in the thought processes? of, uh, I mean, it's a think tank, a general purpose think tank, but it's on the progressive side. It used to have hardly any attention in the past. Are mm -hmm. more people listening to it or less? I think um, uh, if we're talking about the general public, I think a lot of people are paying attention because the Billionaire Bonanza report actually got a lot of traction. So in the print media, at least. So we were covered by CNN, Business Insider, uh, Reuters, even Fox News, you know, uh, picked it up, and even Forbes pub published our report, and they were like, "Hey, the news picked up by Fox News, there must be something wrong with you." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, if they want to give us, you know, free press, uh, okay. we'll take it, but you know, uh, never compromise our ideals, though. Um, but yeah, so it, it got it got traction, and um, you know, some uh, politicians. Um, like Alexandra Costa Cortez, she uh, tweeted out about it and basically understood that you know um, that uh, you know we need uh, good policy in order to um, you know make our society more democratic and, and equitable and um, and uh, if we had you know a proper taxation system, then uh, you know we, the state would have resources to you know do the Green New Deal or uh, have some good unemployment benefits, um, have a guaranteed income or universal health care, things that I think um, should be, you know, I think people's uh, basic necessities should be met. Um, so we did we did get some traction. I think now at the moment um, with the, the, the protests right now uh, against uh, police brutality being led by the Black Lives Matter, I think uh, it's there's there's more of an urge to uh, people want to do something substantial, so so I hopefully you know some of these pro uh, policies uh, or some of our recommendations will inform uh, policymakers because uh, you know the pre-existing condition is you know uh, extreme inequality extreme wealth inequality and, uh, and racial wealth inequality those are the the pre-existing conditions of America. And they're systemic problems, so they need systemic solutions. So, so you're saying more people are listening and um, and and tweeting about it, uh, but you know most of the think tanks uh, have a huge endowment, and billionaires are funding them. Mm -hmm. Who are your billionaires? So, believe it or not, we are not funded by billionaires. Um, we do have a lot of donors who who donate to. Um, our uh, think tank because they uh, believe in you know progressive taxation um, that that they should they should be taxed more um, in order to uh, you know give people a more of an equal opportunity. Well, but, that's Warren Buffett. He says that he pays less taxes than his secretary. So yeah, no, but funding you also. No, so it, he he is paying less taxes than his secretary when you when you add up all the taxes like. Um, you know, sales tax, uh, um, like there's all, there's all these like taxes. And if you add it all up, it's pretty much either the same or less. So, but the thing is, this was interesting, even those who are, who have a lot of, uh, who are wealthy, um, like the best example is Michael Bloomberg, because during the debate, 
he had uh, in, during the presidential uh, uh, primary, um, he said, yeah, we need to um, increase taxes on the rich, but he was against the wealth tax because you know, um, that's where all their money, all their wealth is, all their money is in, is in you know, uh, assets as opposed to what they earn from working. Uh, your average billionaire, 20% they, they, of the income probably comes from working and the other 80% is from things they owned. That, ha that has a dividend or a return. So, um, so fortunately, people like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, AOC, they're all for like a wealth tax. So, and that could raise significant revenue. So, so there are in Texas mostly they want to they 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 support increase uh, of the taxes, but they don't mm -hmm. want to support tax on wealth. Yeah. That's very interesting. You know, as a, as a Muslim, uh, you know, in Quran, there is a huge emphasis on distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. God tells us so that the wealth does not remain in the hands of few people. So when we give, give I mean, we have three types of giving. One is zakat and one is um, a, a, a general um, charity, which is in, encouraged. And then you just don't make money on just money. You have to have a labor. So there are three instruments. Yeah. In the first one, actually, it's on wealth. So you don't give out the card on um, you know income or your income or some, or saving of that time. But it is overall wealth. You give away part of your overall wealth. And so so these people who are billionaires and have increased by half a trillion dollar in the last three months, they don't want to pay wealth tax. So what is your recommendation about the wealth tax? How much money you want to get and how much is your cut in there? <laughs> um, so the wealth tax, I mean, there's different proposals, right? Um, I think the Elizabeth Warren has a pretty good proposal where she just recommends a 2% wealth uh, tax on uh, households who have over fifty million dollars in uh, in household wealth, and I think once you reach a billion, uh, it's it's a three percent uh, wealth tax. So um, it's too low. I mean, I I like Elizabeth. I like to see her as vice president or something. Likewise, but above fifty million, whatever. I mean, that's little big threshold. It is, and and this is why, like, I find the the the, the talking points that are, that are deployed by what, what I would call the the wealth defense defense industry, um, they they act like you know this was somehow, uh, you know, like we're punishing success or whatever. No, but it, it's just it's a it's really small. It, it the tax like the the rate is small, but it would actually generate a lot of revenue. Um, I, I don't have the numbers. Um, in, in my head, but it's it'll be like over 10 years, like hundreds of billions of dollars. So you know? who else has a good proposal like that? Better, better than this one? Oh, the Ber Bernie Sanders, uh, because all his uh, his rates are just a little, uh, little bit um, higher. But the thing I like about Bernie Sanders as well is that, um, because uh, taxation is a part of it, but Bernie Sanders also supports, uh, you know, like worker cooperatives, um and democracy having some democracy at work this could be growing the labor movement so workers can have uh, a, a say and participate in the management of the the company that they work for and then they can negotiate what share of profits goes to the workforce and what share of the profits goes to the owners and shareholders well, uh, brother, that revolution is on pause for now. <laughs> Tell me other proposals which are for wealth distribution. I mean, we Muslims pay 2.5% mm -hmm. of our wealth every year. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me what other, uh, I mean, proposals you have. For example, you have something pandemic profiteering oversight committee. Oh uh, yeah, I like that. So, so you want to get some cut from uh, uh, from whatever. So, if they have made half a trillion dollars, how much we need to get from there? Yeah. So the the logic of the the um, the pand uh, pandemic profiteering committee is um, the problem with any economic crisis, large corporations will benefit disproportionately. 
um, because their their competition goes out of business. So therefore they increase their market share. And then they can also exploit the crisis by raising prices, not according to like supply and demand principles. So the revenue that could be raised from uh, a tax on uh, pandemic profits uh, could be could be enormous, and and this is not without precedent. This I think happened in uh, World War One and World War Two, that the Congress established established some type of committee to to tax excess profits, and then that could be those those that oh, revenue. Even at that time, there were some people making money while the Great Depression was going on. <laughs> exactly, yeah, there they were, and um, yeah, and then. Um, yeah, and then we we also have uh, we call like a millionaire surtax. So for people who are making over two million dollars a year, which is uh, less than one uh, percent of the population, we we have a, a, a tax on people who make over two million dollars a year. And then we've estimated that that would raise over. So tax is a wealth tax, or what type of tax is that? No, this is this is on income. Um, okay, income tax. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a so it's like a, a income surtax. So like a, they'll it's like um, we'll just have a tax on over over uh, people who make over two million, and then we estimated that on the low end that could raise over six hundred billion dollars in ten years. And um, but if we're talking about like wealth, you know, the, another good wealth tax uh, mechanism is uh, uh, an estate tax. Right, so what people get from inheritance, um, you know, uh, it's 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 like it's really low, um, and and it just makes sure that you know that wealth uh, concentration becomes generational. So some so someone like you know Jeff Bezos can, you know, uh, pass on his his wealth to you know let's say his children, um, you know the, he they won't have to pay a significant amount of of, of tax. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking uh, with Omar Okampo, who is from Institute for Policy Studies, and we're talking billionaires bonanza. <laughs> and what can we do to have huge amount of people who have lost their jobs or have already been poor who are struggling for food? How the richest country in the world can be little kinder and little gentler in taking care of its own people. We'll be right back after these messages. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World's Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. And prominent media exposure. 
This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, President of Justice for All. And I'm the Director of Outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to over $600 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand With Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Omar Ocampo. Um, Omar, tell me, um, you know, one of proposal which uh, your report of Billionaire Bonanza is, well, I can't wait until I see the film series on that. <laughs> I think that will be more educational for this think tank than your report uh, coming and going. Uh, discourage wealth hiding through passage of Corporate Transparency Act. What is that? Yeah, so um, so one thing that uh, I think like the the Panama Papers helped reveal is this idea that uh, we have no idea how much wealth is being hid across in offshore accounts and in tax havens, and we definitely want to have uh, so, some more transparency because um, you know uh, because we're we're missing out on a on a ton of revenue that could be uh, a tax can be levied on, um, so. And this is this is this is kind of goes along with what I was saying earlier about the wealth defense industry. So like there's the people who make that up are uh, you know tax accountants, lawyers, and uh, you know their whole uh, thing is basically to hide the wealth of of uh, you know uh, ultra high net worth in individuals and families. So I think that if we were able to have some transparency and see uh, you know how much wealth is is being hidden away, and then we can properly tax it. You know, they'll, 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 they'll fill a lot of holes in our in our uh, and in our budget and, uh, you know, can help fund uh, a lot of things. Well, I thought these Panama papers were all about the dictators in the third world who are hiding their money. 
So you're bringing it to right there in Chicago, uh, in America. Who, who, who in America was hiding their wealth overseas? Um, I can't think of anyone like off the top of my head, but it wasn't third world dictators because I know that uh, someone who got in a lot of trouble was uh, uh, Messi, the, the the football, the soccer player. Um, he uh, showed up on um, the Panama Papers, but in in general, the you know um, again one thing that ultra uh, high net worth individuals do, they always look for a way to dodge a tax system and they look for ways to store their wealth and hide their wealth. So what Corporate Transparency Act would do? I think that would help. I think, well, I would have to have, it would have to be an international thing um, because we would have to collaborate with other governments um, and like uh, like uh, like the Russians and the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, well, first we got to identify where the tax havens are. So, like, uh, normally it's like you know Cayman Islands, Switzerland. Uh, the United States is actually a really big tax haven as well. Really? Yeah. Um, so, like, one place in particular is Delaware. Um, yeah, everybody is registered in Delaware. Exactly. So then they can mask ownership and people. You can never really know who's the owner. So like there'll be like a company, they'll buy something or they have an account and you never know who the real owner is. So so something like a transparency bill would definitely will uh, we would have to reveal, you know, who the owner is, because we want to know, for example, you know, who's who's buying X, Y and Z. Um, so 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 therefore that can you know be good for you know cracking down on corruption, too. Um, but you know, but as far as like tax havens con are concerned, like we, we have to have like a, a you know a lot of international cooperation. Um, there's other people who've done great work on this. Uh, Gabriel uh, Zuckman, he's a, a French economist. Um, he's a, a, a professor here in the United States. I don't recall which institution. I want to say Princeton. Um, he's done a lot of work about uh, you know on hidden wealth, and uh, we re we we use a, a, a lot of his work. To inform our, our ideas on transparency and and you know and making sure that you know people are, are paying their fair share of taxes. Hmm. So some of these major billionaires who uh, who have made half a trillion dollar in last three months, are they implicated in hiding uh, some of uh, the wealth as well? Um, I'm not sure if they're implicated uh, at the moment, for example. Okay. So unless there's a transparency act, we will not know what, what they're doing there, right? Yeah. And, that, and also like, you know, there some people accumulate this wealth, like, uh, like for example, like let's take uh, Eric Yuan, who's the CEO of Zoom. You know, like you can probably say, you know, he was well positioned because he had uh, um, something that got, the, his their demand got increased for that service. Um, so, you know, he was well positioned and he, ha he has seen a, a great increase in wealth. But then there's other people, um, Ernest Garcia, um, he, uh, he's the CEO of Carvana. He's actually being sued by his shareholders right now because he played upon fears of the, of the coronavirus pandemic to make the price of his stock go down and then he basically purchased all those stocks. When they when they plummeted, he just purchased all of them at like basement prices. So wow. yeah, so he's being sued by his show, shareholders right now because uh, they, they they consider this almost like insider trading. So so there are people who I would say you know were well positioned, and uh, you know the you can make the argument you know that they've earned it. They had a, a good business model. I would say that's the case of Zoom, but then you have other people who are exploiting it, um, and then and then you know and then having more concentration of, of wealth and market share um, through I would say unethical means, and uh, that's one example. One of the suggestion uh, Omar Campo, uh, your organization has is a charity stimulus. I mean, uh, right oh. now, I mean, we're a charitable organization, not for profit. And I, we have seen a huge drop uh, in in last three, four months. Our fundraisers got canceled and people who are donating small parties, they don't have a whole lot of money. And we were not in servicing other human beings. We were just, you know, more information and bridge building oriented. But... Uh, 
so so what was the thinking behind that charity stimulus which you are proposing yeah so i think um so we've realized that in the past few years that there's been an increase in philanthropy and that a lot of the charitable giving is like top heavy meaning that uh the rich the wealth the billionaires are giving are are donating more than you know your average person is um so and the thing is is that the the rich use this as a you know for the tax benefit so they donate let's say a uh, hundred million dollars they that money immediately goes to a donor advised fund so if you put a hundred million in that fund they get an immediate tax write-off and then the money that should be given to charity or to be used uh, in a charitable way and theoretically can sit there indefinitely because um, there's no uh, requirement for disbursement. So that money may never reach its desired destination. Wow. So this is one of those loopholes. Exactly. You can put it in uh, that, okay, I'm going to give it uh, to charity and don't give. And it's sitting there. Exactly. Uh, and Instead of reaching. Yeah. So what does uh, what are you recommending that they give out? Uh, why you're saying only ten percent give out? Why not more? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, obviously there's uh, so right now we've estimated there's 120 billion dollars sitting in donor advised funds with no requirement for disbursement. So we want at least uh, ten percent to be dispersed uh, within the next couple of uh, I think we said uh, three years. But you know we can do we can do uh, if you're if people are more ambitious uh, you know we can do twenty percent why not? <laughs> <laughs> Probably they they keep that money in endowment fund and so it can keep raising money and give out only small percentage. Uh, mm -hmm. per, uh, so so there it's sort of uh, a, a model in which they can sustain their charity. So this mm -hmm. is uh, so this is a soft recommendation that at least give ten percent. Of whatever you're taking and taking credit for yeah um, so so state tax is the state tax different from the wealth tax yes um so the wealth so uh, so the wealth tax is basically um basically everyone everything all the assets so that's stocks that's bonds uh that's real estate uh home ownership retirement accounts cash uh, under the bed excuse me cash under the bed also yeah <laughs> yeah cash that uh, they're having in the behind the sofa um and the state tax is more uh is more of wealth that becomes inherited so for example um let's say that my dad just wants to give me let's just pretend my dad's a billionaire and he gives me 100 billion dollars Right, um, and the state tax would tax that hundred billion, um, but it's like a one-time tax. Um, the the wealth tax would be a yearly tax, and that would be based on the the person's net worth or the amount of uh, um, uh, wealth that they have. Hmm. Well, Omar Kampa, you 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 have learned quite a bit in your uh, uh, you know uh, working as a think tank and and mm -hmm. research and billionaires and millionaires and all that. But I'd like to switch a little bit. I mean, you have done your masters in Cairo, yes, sir, where there were millions of people demonstrating for democracy and uh, rights and freedoms, and uh, you were in the midst of it. Uh, would you mind sharing some of your observations of that? What what you saw there? Yeah, so I I arrived in uh, Cairo like uh, in 2011. Um, so it was in the midst of the of the of the Arab Spring, and it was a time where you know people were demanding democracy and dignity and and bread and having uh, uh, you know uh, having their material existence secured. Um, so at the, at the time, I would say that when I was there, there were, a lot of people were very hopeful, uh, people were very optimistic. Um, you know, I was there for the first elections, the, the parliament elections, and people were excited, um, you know, that they were able to, you know, cast a vote, um, because they had, uh, you know, over 30 years of dictatorship under, uh, Hosni Mubarak and then... Who will always get elected by 95% of the voters. Oh, yeah. 
I forgot. Like he had like the like those elections like ten years ago where he won like ninety eight percent. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So I, it, it was very hopeful, but I think there was a lot. There were there was conflict around what they wanted the state to look like um, because you know you had um, um, you know. Uh, some people who were who were who were secular. There was, uh, you know, people uh, Muslim Brotherhood. So there was a lot of clashes uh, along what the state would would look like. Um, but unfortunately, the you know, um, there was a, a, a military. Well, I would argue that it would it was a coup where uh, El Sisi uh, took took over power. And um, as far as like you know, freedom, freedoms and li liberties and democracy, like they, all the gains that they they made uh, were uh, rolled back. So, what what role our government and our billionaires play in uh, countries like Egypt? Well, I would hope they play little to no role, um, because I, I feel like you know um, it, problems like like for example, Egyptian problems should be solved by Egyptians. Um, I think that, you know, the United States could provide uh, diplomatic help. But the thing is, is that I don't think the U.S. foreign policy actually has the interests of the Egyptian, the average Egyptian. And in, in, um, uh, I don't think they have their, their best interests in mind. Um, the, the United States is, you know, always looking for, um, you know, to protect international markets. Um, they want to uh, make sure that e uh, Egypt stays an ally. Um, that's why they give them, uh, I, I think it's like over a billion dollars a year on, um, on military assistance. And, um, because if there was, I think the, you know, if there was any real democracy there, the, um, one of the things that I think the Egyptian people would do is, uh, they would probably reconsider the, the, the peace deal with Israel. So, um. Yeah, but for me, U.S. foreign policy is to make sure that the, the, the integrity of the peace deal remains. So the uh, did U.S. condemn, uh, I mean, supported the democracy movement? Uh, I mean, there were some charges that the Arab Spring is nothing but an American conspiracy or something like that. You were on these streets. Uh, what were people feeling about it? No, so uh, so at, at least in Egypt, there was. Uh, I mean, it didn't start in January twenty fifth. It there's been um, there was a trajectory, you know, of uh, of a lot of civil disobedience in Egypt, um, and and basically, you know, to to gain some more rights, some more freedoms, um, you know, uh, and have uh, less repression. Um, and I also think Egypt was inspired by Tunisia. Um, so the 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 revolution that happened over there. So I think it was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a completely organic uh, movement from, you know, the bottom up arising. I think that uh, Europe was trying to suppress that. And so was the U.S. Uh, the U.S. was um, was not throwing 100% support behind the Egyptian protesters, but they did so when once it was too late. Once the, they saw that the military was not going to stand uh, unconditionally behind Mubarak, they they were like, um, "Yeah, we'll uh, support uh, you know the Egyptian people." But I think they took they also took advantage of Gaddafi once uh, you know Libya set up uh, having an uprising. You know, like Gaddafi was like a historical enemy, so they were saying that you know we can dispose of uh, Gaddafi and then pretend that you know we're on the side of uh, democracy in general. So mm -hmm. I think it, it was they were trying to fill some type of credibility gap that the uh, the West was suffering because the West was on the side of dictators at first. Uh, I, I remember Sarkozy was offering Ben Ali to to send French uh, security forces uh, to suppress the the protesters in Tunis. Mm -hmm. Well, normally people consider Arab Spring to be a failure. What do you think? Well, I, I, I say revolutions are always a process. So uh, I, I also don't think it's linear. Um, I definitely think that um, there, has, there, there has been a setback. So I, I wouldn't say, I'm not comfortable with saying failure because I, I don't think that this process has ended. Um, um, but at, at the moment, it's not looking positive. 
And in the case of uh, Tunisia, actually, I would say that it succeeded. I mean, there have been democratic elections and yeah. uh, I mean, people, are the, 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 all the energy who came out of that revolution continue to create the debate and the discussion and the change of government, don't you think? No, I agree. Uh, so like the silver lining is always, has always been Tunisia. Um, but unfortunately, um, in Egypt, there's a setback. Uh, Libya is looking really bad. Um, and that's, uh, to me, it's a disaster. Um, and uh, and all the, the, the Gulf countries that, you know, they were able to, uh, you know, buy stability. So, um, so at the moment, uh, oh, and then Syria is really bad. So at the moment, um, I would say that the, the Arab Springs has been put on pause. Um, but I would say that, you know, th these are long term, like these are things that happen, you know, long term. But yeah, at the moment, it's, it's a it, it, it's uh, hasn't reached its goals. So design for freedom and liberty and democracy cannot be stopped. People want to live their lives the way they choose. Uh, so I like what you say that uh, the process has not stopped. I mean, people mm -hmm. feeling and what they desire. And in the case of Tunisia, definitely things improved. And, uh, and uh, but, uh, you know, support for democracy from the Western countries uh, was uh, essentially exposed when they jump on CC's support. Uh, they exactly. supported Mubarak until the end. And then as soon as the similar guy comes up, they say, oh, yes, very. I remember being an NPR and somebody before me uh, <clears throat> was being interviewed and he was saying, well, the situation in Egypt is so complex and there are people who have different opinion and this elected person got only 53 or 54 percent of the vote. I said, my God, you know, when we don't want to support something, we say it's very complex. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the same vote Obama got. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that is not complex, but Egyptian situation, elected, democratically elected party, just because we don't like them, it's very complex. You know, we need yeah. to really be very careful about <laughs> thinking. Well, Umar, thank you so much. You have been very helpful. No, no, thank you. And thank you for, uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to, you know, express, uh, to share what, you know, the results of my research and some of my personal thoughts. It's, uh, it's, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You, Omar Ocampo is uh, a researcher at the program of inequality and the common good uh, and co-author of the report. Uh, which is nothing but billionaires bonanza and stay tuned for the serial on that. Uh, thank you so much. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. And, uh, <clears throat> and we are always there on Galaxy 19 Satellite 24-7, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, as well as Muslim Network TV. Pretty soon on Apple TV as well. Thank you. Peace. Salam.